Okay, I think we're all in. All right, so I'm gonna give us a few seconds here for the audience to join and get settled. And while I'm doing that, I'm gonna go over a few logistics. Uh, this webinar is being recorded, so it will be available on demand on Synaptic's Bright Talk channel. If you enjoy it and you wanna share it, um, you can find it here. There's also some documents attached to this webcast. Um, there's a case study, um, there's a project request link. If you have ideas during this webcast and you wanna share them with us at Synaptic, you can do that. And there's also some links to um, other uh, sites that will provide more information about some of our panelists. Um, we will be doing a 60 minute talk after our introduction, um, just a sort of a informal panel discussion with our panelists here who I'll introduce in a moment. Following that panel discussion, we will have a live Q&A. So we'll leave about 10 or 15 minutes at the end for that. Um, if you have questions along the way, just pop them into the um, webcast question uh, section and we will get to them for sure. Um, okay, so thank you for joining us today uh, for this panel discussion entitled Innovation Within Financial Services in a Time of Pandemic. Before we um, you know, introduce the subject, I, I'd like to do introductions for myself and for my fellow um, speakers today, for my panelists. My name is Portia Roberts. I'm head of marketing for Synaptic. I've worked with tech companies all over the world, including those in cybersecurity, agriculture, drones, energy, blockchain, and AI, of course. Um, I have a master's in economics and technology policy from Johns Hopkins SAIS. So this panel is actually um, very interesting to me from a subject matter perspective. And right now I'm streaming from the Washington DC area. With me today is Stefan Mathieu, CEO of DCO which is a uh, client of Synaptics. He is a professional IT executive director, architect, and inventor, more than 25 years of international experience in developing, implementing, delivering, and supporting various IT platforms and emerging solutions. Um, today, Stefan is coming to us from Mexico City, Mexico. And with me as well is Kelly Weaver, CEO of Melrose PER, a leading crypto and blockchain communications agency. Kelly's also known as Crypto Kelly um, and hosts a Crypto Token Talk uh, podcast for those looking to enter a new frontier of blockchain technology and learn Crypto 101 from leading industry experts. She's based in Los Angeles, California. And last but not least, of course, my colleague, Dr. Tim Oates, is a professor in computer science and electrical engineering uh, at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. He has his PhD in computer science from UMass Amherst. He spent his postdoc year at the MIT AI lab <clears throat> before coming to UMBC. He's also co-founder of Synaptic and has uh, incredible experience consulting in a diverse set of industries. And he's streaming live from Baltimore today. So we're, we're sort of all over the, the North American continent, which is kind of cool. <laughs> so welcome you three. Thank you so much for joining me today. Um, just by way of introduction, uh, these are indeed troubling times. Uh, many are struggling with the realities and fears of illness, and many more have lost their jobs. So we don't want to underplay that. But um, with the global economy at a standstill, we're all sort of wondering what's coming next. Unlike previous economic slowdowns, we know the immediate cause for the stagnation. It's not a systemic recession. In this, I think there's hope. Um, as healthcare professionals work hard to bring the COVID-19 pandemic to resolution, I think we see an opportunity for conversations about critical transformations in a post-pandemic world. And that's why we're here today, I think. So what do I mean by that? The strangeness of a quarantine society really highlights the need for innovation in critical areas. Specifically, we all wanna remain connected to buy food, other goods we need, to bank, to file taxes, uh, to, to access medical records or maybe remittances. The intersection of our digital worlds and compliance requirements haven't fully adapted to accommodate this activity efficiently and securely. For example, the regulatory waiver uh, that was put in place until the pandemic, uh, sorry, there was a regulatory waiver that until the pandemic constrained the use of telemedicine in the US, and that's a good example of this, um, one question that we might have is, will this continue after the pandemic? Will we still be able to use telemedicine? 
Emerging technology has promised to improve our connectivity, perform physical and digital tasks in the absence of humans, improve data analytics, transform security, and reduce inefficiencies. Doubtless, new tech will do more and change things in ways we cannot yet imagine. So what's happening now? And what can we expect? Financial services often lead as early adopters of new technology. So in the next hour, we'll focus on innovation in this space and how COVID-19 is or isn't impacting or accelerating change. Uh, our panelists will also draw on their broader industry experience to illustrate how other critical infrastructure sectors might experience um, as it relates to our discussion today. So without further ado, I am very eager to hear first, what inspired each of you to join this panel today? Besides the fact that I asked you. <laughs> for which <laughs> Let's start with Stefan. Hello, everybody. I'm very excited to be here um, with all of you today. Um, I'm very inspired by, by trying to bring uh, new technologies to improve our lives, to improve our way we interact together, to improve the, the, the way we can uh, interchange our own personal information in a safe, in a safe manner, in a safe fashion. And all of this in in this uh, pandemic and in in this social distancing uh, distancing uh, effort that we're all trying to cope and live with today. So I'm very uh, proud and happy to to bring some new ideas to this discussion, and um, and we'll do that in the in the in the following minutes. Excellent, thank you, Kelly. Hi, Portia. Thanks so much for inviting me to be here today. Um, I mean, I wanted to paint a little uh, picture into my background as well um, beyond what you shared, which is that, you know, I didn't have a background in technology or in uh, financial services uh, prior to just a few years ago. I was in PR and marketing um, mostly for consumer products and, you know, more mainstream audiences and was introduced to a blockchain company in my backyard here in Santa Monica, California. And, you know, the need for tech uh, communications and through my experience working with that company, Gem, which I'll, I'll speak more about specific examples of things that we did with them. But my introduction to this technology really opened my eyes uh, to the potential power of blockchain. And although the tech itself isn't really that sexy uh, at its core, the potential implications of um, implementing systems, which will, you know, ultimately affect our lives in a more positive way and efficiencies and systems where we see inefficiencies today really, uh, you know, enlighten me that, wow, there is an opportunity for communications here. And I don't need to necessarily understand the nitty gritty technical aspects to be able to explain the potential implications. And so I think I bring more of a mainstream um, and more, hopefully a more palatable approach to technology, uh, given my sort of uh, unique background. And um, hopefully I can uh, you know, explain some of the different ways in, in uh, certainly today in the pandemic of you know, inefficiencies that we're seeing today and how potentially technology could really improve our lives and, uh, and wh what we're seeing happen in, at, at a rapid pace given you know, the, the extreme immediate need for these technologies and efficiencies. Definitely. And Tim, what about you? What brings you here today? Yeah, thanks. thanks so I've been thinking about AI for a long time. Uh, if the color of my beard didn't key you off to the fact that I'm not the youngest person here, I will tell you that <laughs> I started my PhD in 1993. It's a long time ago. So I've been thinking about AI and machine learning for quite a while. And the things that are most interesting to me in that space have to do with how do you get machines to make perceptual judgments? So these are things that are really easy for humans to do. So here's a document, is that document signed? or uh, here's a box. Uh, I opened it. I ordered something. Is the thing in the box the thing that I uh, that I thought I was going to get? Um, and so, AI for a long time has been trying to solve problems like that. It just turns out that recently we've made great strides in that space. And I think that as more and more of the economy gets pushed online, including having people deliver our groceries and deliver our food, there are lots of opportunities for um, understanding what's happening in the physical world to try and fight or combat fraud, but also what's happening in the online world, trying to extract information from documents that are floating around all over the financial system these days. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's an interesting point, I think, in the, uh, 
the evolution of AI from that perspective. And it, you know, it's also worth mentioning that um, this panel might have been held in person had this pandemic not been happening. And so I think too, um, that that's another reason why we're here. So it's the, just these new ways of communicating and doing things are impacting all of our lives in, um, in every way, which is, uh, it's pretty incredible. But so, hey, Paul. Mm -hmm. Portia, let me, um, let me add um, a, a couple of comments here and why I'm, yeah. I'm so excited of being, of being here in this, in this panel. In, in, in my career, I've always been, um interested in in and in working in the field of protecting uh, personal information so as we do all kinds of things now these days presence less or uh, remotely there is a definite need for um uh, for building stronger technologies when it comes to protecting our own information while we interact with others and instead and other uh, people and institutions so um, in my expertise um, the digital world today will will uh, converge uh, with our analog life. So this is why we need things like uh, contact contactless biometrics, um, advanced biometrics based on on artificial intelligence and, and machine learning, uh, which will uh, help us in protecting our 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 our, our uh, digital wallet full of of personal information. Sure. Sure. There's a lot of promise in that. It'll be wonderful to see it um, come to fruition, I think. And so we can talk more about that in a minute. Um, so obviously technology can't solve political people or systemic problems in and of itself. That said, in your view, what are the biggest challenges plaguing financial services today that new or emerging technology has a hope of solving? Has the pandemic highlighted any of these in surprising ways for you? And we can start with Tim. Yeah, so uh, I I think in a number of industries, financial services being one of them, there's this tension between paper and digital representations of content. As a you know, in, in Synaptic's consulting practice, there are many many cases where somebody comes to us and says, "Here's a PDF document that a human constructed for other humans to to read and understand." But what we'd really like to do is get the content back out of it, mm -hmm. right? And so the issue is. Is there some way for a machine to look at those documents and extract information and take something that was originally digital, that was converted into a PDF and maybe scanned a few times, and then um, put that information back into a digital format that machines can reason about to support smoothing out business processes and analytics and a variety of kinds of things. So that's one area where AI can help. Um, another area that's very common, so AI has a very long history in financial services of attacking uh, problems of fraud. Mm -hmm. There are many fraud detection systems that are data driven. Mm -hmm. But again, I think that, uh, as I said earlier, as more and more transactions are around people doing things for you in the physical world, as there, as there are, is a desire to distance from others, then there are ways in which AI can help ensure using machine vision methods, for example, that those tra transactions are um, running according to the way that both parties want them to, to try and identify where those transactions go wrong. And so I think both of those are really areas where AI can um, make significant inroads even today. So just, um, you mentioned like transactions. So in terms of the problem, the problem that AI in theory is solving in this case is, is detecting anomalies in behavior? Yeah, so, okay. Uh, a couple of my daughters have worked at restaurants mm -hmm. um, and uh, they dislike uh, uh, DoorDash, I guess, <laughs> or, or the various uh, food delivery uh, systems because it is not unusual for people who order food to call back and say the order is not right. You know, something okay. is missing. Um, and so the question is, can I use AI methodologies? I just got a camera hanging out, um, looking at what's going on and say, well, the order was fine when it left here, your driver ate half of your sandwich, for example. Uh, but that problem plays out all over the place in many different circumstances. So uh, for delivery systems, so UPS or FedEx, mm -hmm. you know, the FedEx driver says they delivered the box, but it, it never arrived. So okay. when we use machine vision techniques as a, sort of a physical analog of, I think, a lot of what tries to happen in the blockchain. So the mm -hmm. blockchain, and, you know, I think Kelly will probably speak to this, is trying to track sort of digitally transactions that are happening and ensure mm -hmm. that they are recorded and valid, but then there's a lot of stuff that just happens in the physical world that you don't have that control over. Right. The AI can kind of bridge that gap. 
So what I understand you're saying is there's there's what's going on in the physical world, and then there's what ends up in the digital world, and yeah. part of the gap can be, and that that gap is the problem, right? So you, yep. have, whereas from the point of origin of a transaction to the end, did the problem occur? That's right. You're living in the physical world, and it would be nice to understand what happens as something sort of flows through whatever chain it's flowing through, right? And so yeah. Kelly can definitely her te techniques can have control over it, you know, when it's sort of touching some digital point, right? But what happens in between is often just a big mystery. And, and a lot of stuff happens there that you would like to have control over. Right. So Stefan, from your perspective, what are some of the, the biggest challenges plaguing financial services today? <clears throat> well, after this pandemic, I, I, I certainly believe that we are gonna change a lot uh, of our way of living. So uh, just as Tim mentioned, there is no, I don't see any option in the future, in the near future, than trying to have technologies that help us merge our, 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 our digital life with our analog life. The way you walk down the street, going to the bank to do a cash withdrawal. So um, it, it's becoming clear to, to me day after day that we, we get through this all together is that it's going to change everything it's, the pandemic is going to change the way we transaction in a bank presence less uh, safe and secure interaction and transa transaction is now is the new now now uh, and during and after this pandemic uh, we're going to have to uh, to make a major shift in the financial uh, uh, verticals to to basically have less of the the paper pushing task we have to do especially in mexico and in emerging economy in an emerging country can, can where you everything talk about that? Specific, say that again? could you speak more specifically to that like some of the challenges uh, that you face in mexico in terms uh, of ab uh, absolutely mexico is now like an incubator for uh for uh basically enrolling uh, a flesh and bone person into a digital process and making sure that the person is who's enrolling uh in this financial uh, typical um, interaction is the real uh, person you really want as a customer. So me uh, Mexico was typically, the financial industry in Mexico was typically um, overcrowded with with bank paper formats to fill out. We still uh, in Mexico can't sign official documents electronically. It needs to be to be either sign on a piece of paper with the, with a signature and a pen, mm -hmm. or it has to be something that is called here by the law and express consent. So uh, the express consent has to, can be digital, but it has to be validated by by a living person at the end. So it, inv it invalidates completely the, dig the digital process. But sure. so it, it, the reality here is that. Um, Many many of those processes are overcrowded with with papers and 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 pens. So we're trying to 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 bring technologies to the market like like AI and machine learning based biometric uh, technologies, intelligent enough to see if the person is really uh, is not spoofed with with a heartbeat from their foreheads. And, then, and that means um, also as we get into this paperless, presenceless, uh, digital financial processes and, and, and interaction, we're going to expose a lot more of our own data out mm -hmm. there. You know? mm -hmm. So another thing that happens in the market, uh, in the financial, uh, uh, in, in the financial demographic pyramid in Mexico, is that the, the top of the pyramid as uh, our banker eyes they have they have uh, access to financial inclusion inclusion easily but the custody of their of their personal information is in the hands of a third party either mm -hmm. a credit bureau or a bank and the base of the pyramid has actually literally no information into the system and they have full cust custody of their own personal information either mm -hmm. by holding a piece of plastic in their hand or having various papers that prove their identity so all of this is going to have to to reverse itself, and then we're going to have to have to to bring those technologies to the, to the markets, to the various markets we want to attend, in order to facilitate and have a better balance into into the the, the personal information custody. It's it's so fascinating. We take um, I mean three of us are in the United States, right? And um, 
whether or not we've traveled internationally, I think we just take for granted our ability to transact so much um, mm -hmm. in terms of financial services um, digitally, but there's still issues here, obviously. Mm -hmm. And um, a, a lot of the rest of the world is still struggling to, to do what Mexico is, is uh, struggling to do. So I think um, just n not being alone here in America in, in this sort of stay at home um, world that we're in right now, I think what we're seeing, and, and I'm gonna, I'm so excited to hear more about this from from you guys and from Stefan in in a few moments. But um, we're seeing how the rest of the world is gonna force the hand, maybe, of some of these new technologies to make a difference in the way that they're doing things. And I think it'll touch us here too, um, in the U.S. So that's great, Kelly. How about you? What for you? What are the big problems that you're seeing um, plaguing the financial services industry that you think? Um, are coming to light now. Well, it's interesting you mentioned this global need, um, you know, for technology right now. Um, you know, we, all, all four of us here are very privileged to have connectivity right now. Um, you know, certainly anyone who's tuning in has the benefit of, of connectivity as everything's moving digitally, uh, you know, and we're able to work remote to a certain extent and, you know, access financial services remotely and really education, all sorts of things. We need to be connected to to the internet, right, um, in order to be able to do any of that. And uh, one of the projects that we worked with was called Right Mesh, which was uh, talking about mesh networks, which is basically where you're able to share your internet connection to the next closest physical person through a hop. And, you know, these can sp sprawl out. So if you're thinking about, you know, places in Africa where there's very limited uh you know, connection to bandwidth, you can actually, you know, physically sort of hop to the next person. And you think about this as a, a brilliant solution, and, and it really is. But, you know, the, the question has been, why would I share my connectivity? And, um, and so what RightMesh was trying to solve for is the instant settlement, the flow of money through that system so that you, if you are sharing your connectivity with the next person, you're getting uh, financially rewarded for that at a very microscopic level, but it's able to instantly sort of settle. And uh, it's interesting, we work with a, a company called HerCode, which brings blockchain education to uh, women and even students in uh, here in at USC, but then also in Afghanistan. And uh, it's really kind of tragic right now during the pandemic, the Afghanistan program is basically on hold because yeah. there's no, we don't have a, an access, you know, a way to get these women the digital education because they don't have access to connectivity. So I think, you know, at a global scale, this is something that we certainly as Americans take for granted, um, you know, the access to connectivity, but it is very expensive. I mean, you know, uh, even on a personal level. And I think that that will hopefully the cost will come down as there's more efficiencies in the system. But that's one way that I think, you know, blockchain can really improve uh, the lives of folks because, you know, access to information is considered by the UN a basic human right. And it's something that, you know, a large part of the world doesn't necessarily have on a daily day basis. So. And Americans too, right? And Mexicans. I mean, it's it's not just as far as Africa. I know um, yes. the issues that uh, Indian reservations here are facing was that they, they can't work from home. They can't l take classes online. Um, a lot of them live in LTE deserts or whatever. You know, they don't have cell network or anything. So um, exactly. connectivity is a big one um, that the promise of technology could potentially solve. And um, and education too. You touched on that as a as it relates to connectivity, but I think um, education and understanding, right? That uh, how to use an app on your phone to to sign up for um, banking or um, connect with your um, you know linking to your neighbor and things like that. So that's another interesting one. So in terms of uh, terms such as blockchain and AI, these are really broad buckets, and you guys have been touching on different technology terms, biometric, AI, blockchain, mesh networks. Um, but they really, they're broad buckets that describe discrete technologies that are evolving uh, in these spaces. So as experts in your respective fields, can you highlight a handful of discrete technologies that you're particularly hopeful about as it relates to the problems you just talked about? And I'd like to start with Kelly this time. Um, you get a lot of, um, you know, FaceTime really with different blockchain companies. What are you really excited about right now? Well, certainly one of the things I'd love to hear more from Stefan about is, is really the, the issue of security as we're moving more and more financial services, uh, you know, online. There's, you know, this central point of failure seems like a big frightening, uh, you know, the sort of the elephant in the room as we're moving 
all of our you know, personal information uh, into a digital sphere. And so one of the ways I think that blockchain can, can help that is really, you know, the, the sort of decentralized nature of the technology where there's not one central point of failure where the, the, the um, information is spread out. Um, and I'm sure Stefan, you can speak more to that, but security is definitely on my mind right now. Um, so, I think there's room for efficiencies, you know, as the government was talking about distributing the stimulus package, for example, you know, there was talk of, of CBDCs, you know, in a digital dollar initiative. And couldn't we have, you know, uh, Americans have access to is central bank digital uh, central bank, bank digital currency, um, you know, so couldn't there be um, you know, a better way of flowing this money through the system? Because I know that I know from, you know, family members and, and friends experience getting access to these funds is definitely, definitely very clunky and inefficient right now. And I'm sure, uh, you know, Stefan as, as well, you have access to, to more details on that. But, um, you know, I think that, that that could definitely be improved by systems like, you know, implementing either, you know, blockchain technology and, um, and some kind of form of flowing that, you know, that currency digitally to folks. Um, smart contracts make a lot of sense in, in cases where you can have machines and, you know, Tim, this is sort of your expertise that if this, then that contract where you can digitally, um, you know, have approvals and settlements. So uh, those are sort of some of the things that I'm thinking about uh, as it relates to this pandemic and improving those inefficiencies that we see today. Tim, what about you from a AI perspective, what what's getting you going in terms of the specific technologies in your space? Right. So um, the fields of artificial intelligence and machine learning are basically consumed with one idea these days. I mean, you know, that's an overstatement, but um, this notion of deep learning, and I don't know how much people in the audience know about deep learning, but um, so machine learning algorithms, uh, there are a wide variety of them. And for a long time, people have sought inspiration from the human brain, right? Because people are the in most intelligent things we know. So let's try and figure out what the brain is doing. So there's a category of algorithms that are based around what are called neural networks. And a neural network is, you think about a neuron in your brain, you've got very large numbers of those. They're relatively homogenous. They take in inputs, they produce outputs, and those outputs go to other neurons. So a, a deep neural network is nothing more than these simple kind of computational units, each of which just computes a function and then passes its value on to other neurons in that neural network. And this is a kind of a dramatic oversimplification, but the field has, through a couple of things, discovered that you can do some really amazing things if you have many layers of these neurons that are kind of propagating information forward. Mm -hmm. And the enablers of that have basically been one access to lots and lots of compute. Yeah. So uh, most of this kind of work is done on machines that have uh, GPUs or graphic processing units. They can do a lot of computations in parallel um, and then having access to a lot of data. So if I have a ton of data and a lot of compute, I can build a deep neural network that can learn all kinds of things. And so um, some of the technologies, again, in terms of trying to deal with the problem that Stefan was talking about where I've got all this paper. So what he's trying to do is to make the paper go away. And the thing that interests me is saying, well, we still got a lot of paper floating around for the time being until he's super successful. Uh, you know, how do we come <laughs> out of that? And so uh, deep neural networks are used for all kinds of applications there. So optical character recognition or OCR, just trying to read the text that's on a page. They're also the default for doing speech recognition. So the reason that you can talk to your you know, home devices is that we've done that. We've trained up these deep networks to do speech recognition. Thank you for not saying the the words though, because you don't need all of our devices going off right now. That's exactly <laughs> right. That's right. <laughs> so, uh, so all this around document understanding, identifying objects and pictures, there are deep networks that will look at a picture and generate a sentence describing it. Um, and I, you know, I know that a lot of the technology that Stefan is using is, is in that space is deep neural networks applied to a variety of kinds of problems to do these presenceless transactions that he's talking about. Fascinating. Well, Stefan, they keep referencing you, so we might as well ask you, <laughs> what's exciting well, it, it, to you right now in terms of specific technologies and how you see them evolving? I'm ex extremely excited by very various technologies, what, what blockchain, obviously, uh, all the flavor of it, uh, and also um, deep learning, convolutional neural network, and also a thing called GAN. Everybody's talking about GAN now, generative adversary networks. Um, I'm going to put a problem out there that 
uh, that uh, that the markets is usually turning a blind eye on, on, and and I'm going to explain uh, the use of some advanced technology to basically secure um, our own information, our personal information, and transactions using something new, a uh, change in paradigm. So the world market has been has been using uh, cryptographic keys to secure transaction communication channels for decades now. So that key concept, it's called the key for, re for a reason. So that key concept used that metaphor of having a key placed into a doorknob and it opens. So if the key is not in the same place as the doorknobs, while it's locked, things are safe. Well, that it's not the, those systems that are uh, generating those keys of um, storage devices and um, those storage devices. Can you guys still hear me? We can, it just yeah. broke up for one second. Okay, it's just that my uh, ear pods battery went down, sorry. Uh, that's what that was. <laughs> so, I mean, cause those, those storage devices stored keys upon generation and there is a key management system that basically sometimes sends the keys to a cell phone and it gets stored in, 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 in a different place. And now you have the doorknob and the key in the same place. So things are not that secure anymore. Sure, yeah, it's good enough. Yeah. But what if one day we could basically lock everything up with our face? So you don't need a key sitting anywhere. You don't need a password to enter into a bank application, or you don't need um, a, a paper boarding pass and an agent looking at you as you cross those gates to get to your airplane. What if we we're using advanced technology like contactless bi bi biometric technologies that are that are basically um, a, a machine learning system that actually reads your three-dimensional version of your face, computes it in a mathematical formula, and generates an in-the-air virtual cryptographic keys that doesn't exist anywhere, and it actually opens and closes doors for you as you as you move on with your life during on a daily basis while transferring money, buying flight tickets going to uh, to the to the store and pay at the cashier or simply put your face in front of a, a camera at an ATM machine to withdraw a hundred dollars so let uh, me let me ask you one question about that though so the biometric aspect of that right where like my face opens up the door or the, the virtual door in, when I, I lived in Atlanta for a couple of years there was uh, there were incidents of people taking taking folks off their front porch in downtown Atlanta walking them over to ATMs and then and then forcing them at gunpoint to like put in their keys or whatever. Yes. How what's happening with biometrics that can prevent that type of a scenario? And like I won't even bring up like what we've seen in you know sci-fi movies that people can do to try to spoof biometric authentication. Oh. Like, is there something happening in terms of biometric authentication today that will prevent that type of um, fraud or spoofing or or just you know sure. criminal activity? Very important question, Portia. So uh, uh, typically in the biometric market, which is, is, is basically in a tsunami uh, wave of changes right now, mm -hmm. we used to rely a lot of on, on op, uh, uh, rely on optical devices to read biometrics like fingerprints and or your faces. Mm -hmm. So every time a provider comes that uh, wants to sell you a biometric system, it's always talking about your cell phones camera megapixels that you need to have before you can you even begin to think to use a biometric system. Well, now in days, the, the, those systems are changing and they're becoming uh, intelligent. So they're based on AI and machine learning. Um, and they ba basically don't care much about the, 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 the camera resolution. They use a mathematical algorithm to read, to read to try the three-dimensional uh, version of your face and compute uh, real time uh, if really this face is a projection of another cell phone or a tablet, or it's a face in front of a camera, and you don't need to 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 do anything active to make sure that that the system recognizes you as alive and not a spoof. So we wor we're working on various things like measuring the the forehead and the cheeks of the person mm -hmm. to detect the, the, our heartbeat and making sure that that person is not a photo or a, another image from a, from another devices. So imagine that working on a, on a, on a daily basis 
you can just go to the grocery store and you don't need to touch cash you don't need to to grab anything you just put your face in front of a camera mm -hmm. it recognize you and it calls a set of cryptographic keys that have been generated by by uh, as as Tim mentioned, a convolution or neural network, and it decrypts your wallet. Then you pay and you go. You grab your bags and you go. So that's where we're trying to bring um, the the people to change the paradigm, and that um, their analog behavior is going to become very soon digital. You know, you just but with. It, things like image processing, intelligent camera that detects where you're walking to, that detects your face. So add those points to a, a place where you can store data like blockchain, which is unmutable, auditable, and it's tamper-proof. And then you're, you're, uh, you're getting close to a very good state of, of being sure that uh, your data is not getting leaked, leaked anywhere else than than where you want to, want it to be. Sure, it's an interesting convergence. So mm -hmm. I want to go a little bit deeper um, on that with you, Stefan. So at the moment, you're involved with a company that is specifically looking to solve some of the unique challenges we've been talking about. Um, I'd like for you to tell us a little bit more about what you're doing and why, um, and to share your perspective on how this work has changed, if at all, in, in light of the COVID-19 pandemic. I just want to add too that if Tim or Kelly would like to ask you questions during this time, I'd like to, to allow them to do that because I know I've been I've been dropping in extra questions here and there for you guys. And I want to, I really want to hear what Stefan's doing in more uh, detail. And I know that Kelly and Tim have some uh, some interest in that as well. So. So as the chief executive officer of a company called DCO based out of Mexico City, our core business is to uh, bring new technologies to the market to basically uh, protect data and to interact and transaction in a, in a safer fashion, utilizing different technology in the context of uh, social distancing, distancing, um, um, financial um, interaction. I mean, we all know we that. We were doing this before, right? Like this is yeah. even several months or a year or so down the line, down the process of this, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. We're we're into this has been uh, almost um, 18 months okay. so so we all know we assume that uh, within Me within Mex the mexican market the brick and mortar branches is a thing of the past no we also know nowadays that um, the, di the the digital experience of end user does not mean attractive here in this market it means just patching the hole in terms of serving functionality so we're trying to to build services uh, through APIs and also through uh, various uh, type of, of user interface like white label SDKs and, and an application so uh, defined as DCO to offer um, the normal human being uh, features and functions that will help them protect their, inf their information and transaction between themselves and institution or another person in a secure fashion. So we've designed, invent things that don't necessarily are existing in the world right now. Uh, when you're in, enroll and in, when you enroll yourself into an application, uh, there is a nice process in the screen that you go through. But in the back, usually it's a little uh, lightish what's happening with your data and where it goes. So we actually studied this process that we all go through at one point in our in our present life during this pandemic and of enrolling ourselves for a service, and, and we went through all of this in very deep in a detailed fashion, and we actually try to tighten up the loose ends and making sure that there is no um, there is no weak spot during this entire process of trying to enroll yourself and then transactioning or in, interacting with the system. So, all of this is using technologies like. Um, contactless, contactless intelligence biometrics uh, in conjunction with machine learning and artificial intelligence, spe speech text engine, and also uh, an underlaying uh, platform that has a predictive data analytics side to it, and also a cryptographic side with with the use of blockchain. So I want to, I just want to like paint a picture for a second. Um, I'm imagining I've been to Mexico City, and I know it's. It's the biggest city in the world, right? 
it just goes on and on and on. When you fly in, you start flying in over Mexico City and you fly in over Mexico City for like 15 minutes before you land. It's, it's incredible. Um, there are populations that live, you know, like on the outskirts of that, right? So this is like my imagination. I'm like, I've lived in countries that have, that have these problems. So I'm, I'm picturing that there are people who live outside of like main, uh, like city areas or places that have banks where they can then just walk in and open up a bank account, right? So in in Mexico specifically, you've got these t people living in Pueblos who need to be able to, to like transact financially, right? And, and either they don't, or they maybe they do it um, when they come into town every once in a while to trade or something like that. Mm -hmm. so, so specifically in Mexico, that's one of the things you're, your technology, your company is looking to solve for. But I find what I find so interesting now is that there are now many people who are in a similar situation to those people in Mexican towns who don't have access to banks, mm -hmm. who need access, who like maybe were more traditional, like to go to the bank, take out cash or whatever. And so there's people now all over the world who are maybe seeing a little piece of this kind of poverty of, of um, not being able to access a bank or money in the way that um, they were before. I think that's really interesting. And I, I would like, I mean, I'm, I'm using my imagination, but like, can you paint that picture a little bit better for us? Like what, what is, what happens? Like what is the result of all these people who can't access or who, you know, don't have frequent access to the banking system in Mexico? What does that mean for Mexico, Mexico's economy? Mm -hmm. So it is extremely important. As a matter of fact, the federal government of this country is is uh, turning financial inclusion into a law by uh, issuing regulation through the Bank Commission of Mexico that forces bank to uh, to to include and, and induce day-to-day um, -day cash users uh, into the financial system, and it's it's an obligation that each banks they have to basically take the brick and mortar through a cell phone or through somebody standing on the corner with a tablet through the rural, rural area so people can bankerize themselves. So uh, it's also a, a uh, it is also a law that everybody in this country has access to a, an identification, official identification and in, 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 in an identity. So it, it, it as those technology converge, uh, the banking industry is trying to take advantage of the the, the digital um, right to have access to uh, an identification. Both of those uh, new regulation converges into into a very fast accelerating process of bringing identification and, and financial services in the rural area to, to everybody that mm. not necessarily have a cell phone. There's 133 million people living in this country. Mm. So there is there is a, 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 a penetration rate in terms of the smartphone uh, of about 60%. There's 73 million smartphone down the street in all over the all over the country. And it doesn't matter if it's if, if, if you're talking about an urban area or a rural, rural area. Mm -hmm. So things are converging and laws are, are getting changes that are make are going to make people benefits from from those changes. It's all have to be done into a very secure and protected fashion. So so this is what we bring to the table as DCO. We bring so, tools to, to secure those transactions and interactions with the financial systems. Yeah, so I, it, it's interesting because I, I the, the fact of a 60% penetration of smartphones means that there's still 40% of the population that doesn't have access to the technology. But it does strike me that building the kind of system that you're building, if you know your biometrics are the key, then you know I could borrow your smartphone, right? So if I know someone who has a smartphone, I can say, hey, I need to do a bank transaction. Can I use it? I can conduct that transaction securely. And then when I hand the phone back to you, um, you, you can access my information, right? Because I don't have these passwords floating around. Um, so that seems like a, um, a benefit of the approach. And, and I, I guess I'm just idly curious as to you know, what fraction of the population that just is completely cut off from this kind of technology. There is there is quite a significant amount of, uh, of of people that are cut off from the technology. Mm -hmm. This is why we're trying to make this 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 technology uh, device agnostic. 
So we're we're trying to take it to, to merge the analog life of having a, a, a network of of, of places and ATMs and device and kiosk that that uh, the people who live in the rural area that forms a part of that 40% have access to those services. So it is extremely important that that this technology is device agnostic. So you can use your your Tesla if you want as a, as a, as a device to transaction if you're in Mexico City, or you can go into some ATM machine that have a, that has just a video camera to identify your, yourself in transaction. You don't even need an identification. That's the idea. So we're, we're that we're working on. So in terms of the the impact of the the current global crisis, does does this change anything for you, or is everything sort of just moving along the way that it it was before? It 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 accelerates. Uh, the needs and uh, we are being pressured to 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 cut our our project plan in half so we can bring this to the market as soon as possible. Okay. I mean, most of it is done yet. We're 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 just putting the piece together and 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 putting the puzzle together so it's it's comfortable for the end user, so it's frictionless. So really, we're 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 scrambling to get to get this to the market. It's it's awesome. I I. Um... I'm I'm excited to see it when it when it comes out. Um, so shifting gears a little bit, Tim. Um, so much of AI seems far fetched and speculative, um, but there's a lot going on, and there's a lot of practical application going on. And of course, we all interact with AI every day if we've got our devices in our pockets that can hear us ask them questions and things like that. Earlier, you talked about um, some of the things you're you're excited to see in terms of um, neural networks and other um, areas of AI that, that uh, are evolving uh, in terms of their impact on financial services. Can you expand on those and discuss what you see coming down the line next? Um, for example, what's different about machine vision capabilities today that will help transform biometric authentication using facial recognition? And right. are there other tech industries, perhaps critical infrastructure sectors that would benefit from adopting some of these technologies? Right. Okay. So let me address the last part first. Okay. Um, the thing that's different today is, as I said earlier, that we have a lot of compute and a lot of data. Um, you know, the it, it's definitely the case that the the community, the machine learning community, has come up with some very clever um, algorithms and different kinds of networks. Uh, but on some level, the bottleneck, so the reason we weren't able to do this, I don't know, 20 years ago, is because we just didn't have the compute horsepower or the, the data to be able to estimate these models accurately. Mm -hmm. So um, the thing that's different now is that on a cell phone, you can actually do some relatively sophisticated processing, right? So I can take images, I can do some processing on those, I can send those out to the cloud. In the cloud, I can spin up these large clusters of machines that have GPUs in them. Um, and so I'm, you're able to service actually, you know, a very large population of users and do some really interesting things with respect to biometrics. Um, so, I mean, I think that's largely what's different today. Um, the, the other, I mean, another place where this gets applied, and, and I mentioned this earlier, was this, this tension between here's a document that I can read, but I would like the machine to have access to that information. And so I, mean, I can just tell you one use case that we've looked at. There's, um, there's a, a, a legal services company that we worked with, and they've talked about this project publicly. And uh, they are in the immigration law space. And so what they'll do is they will have their clients upload a variety of documents. So um, you know, it's a, an ID or a passport or a government form or something like that. They get scanned and uploaded to their system. And previously, they were having to go in and manually say, oh, this thing is their passport photo, or this thing is government form X. And it was very labor intensive. And so we worked on a system that first did document classifications. Can I just look at a document and go, oh, that's a scan of a passport. Now, you might think that's easy. I was going to say, that sounds easy. Yeah. Why isn't it? That's right. Well, is yeah, um, because it, because there are passports from all over the world. Passports all look different, right? And so, machine learning systems, I can say, here's a thousand U.S. passports, um, and it will go, okay, I understand what a passport looks like. 
And as soon, as soon as you show it a Canadian passport, it goes, well, that's not a U.S. passport. I've never seen that before. Right. So there's a, there's a lot of work that has to go into trying to make the systems general, to gather enough data for it. Um, and so you can use deep neural networks to solve that document classification task, and, and that works well. And then the next stage is to say, now that I know it is you know, a driver's license, for example, can I read the driver's license number off of it? Or can I read the person's name or their birth date? And to get back to the earlier point, if you did this 10 or 15 years ago, what you would do is you would take that thing and hand it to an OCR engine that was bad, and it would give you garbage back out. OCR is? Optical character recognition. So take it, thank you. So taking <laughs> a, a picture of text on a page and then turning it into text that you can represent in a computer, right? So we essentially sort of read it, pull out the words, but not the meaning of the words, right? So that's that would be a, a later processing stage. But, you know, OCR tools were sort of okay. Um, but by virtue of this, you know, kind of revolution in deep learning, many more sophisticated methods have been developed. I would say OCR now is pretty good, but it is still, um, you know, if, if, if an OCR system makes an error, you know, two out of a hundred characters, then it, it's still extremely painful to deal with. Mm. But you can actually train these systems up to say, uh, I can recognize where there's a signature. Um, is there a signature on this form in the appropriate area? Mm -hmm. Or localize where the driver's license number is and then do a good job of pulling that information out. So um, I, th I think that the, the change that has occurred is that we've got the, the data and the compute. And it, and it is the case that you know a, a grad student in a course on machine learning can in a couple of days build something that would have been almost impossible 15 years ago. Wow. Right, just because again, we've got very sophisticated tooling, so the machine learning stack for this kind of thing is very well developed. Sure. Um, okay, so so that problem, you know, kind of comes up all over the place. That is, I've got documents, and again, in financial services, uh, you know, there's a lot of stuff that's just on paper. And as we try and move to a situation where we can identify fraud more quickly that information needs to be digitized so that we have access to it. But we've also worked on, we've worked for other companies that are um, squarely in the financial services industry doing exactly the same thing. We've done work on trying to extract content from restaurant menus. Uh, we've done a project where people are shipping products and there's a, a detailed list of what's in the product and things like what temperature range has, has it been exposed to. And you have to extract that to make sure that the product is still good. Hmm. Um, and then the the other case that I, I think is kind of interesting is I've, I've got a friend who is involved with uh, one of the large shipping companies. And, uh, and, and again, that they have an ongoing problem of uh, a package is delivered and the driver says, I delivered it. And the person says, I never got it. Right. And you're stuck. So, so typically somebody eats that cost. It's usually not the person. They say it never showed up and who knows where that went wrong, right? The, the, the person who received it could have gotten it and said they didn't get it. It might not have ever made it onto the driver's truck. The driver might have said, no, I like the look of that box. I'm going to keep it and I'm going to fake a stop at that location, even if they're using GPS. So um, a lot of these technologies can be used to kind of secure in some sense those physical transactions that are going on um, in a way that blockchain right now, I think, has a hard time touching them. And you can do that with deep learning methods that are looking at things like activity recognition. So I can say, oh, the GPS says the truck stopped at this location. I've got cameras on it. Did the driver actually grab a box or the correct number of boxes, walk out to that per person's you know, front porch and put it down and come away? So people are trying to solve some of this stuff with say ring cameras. So, uh, you know, this, these right. smart cameras will take pictures when stuff is moving, for example, but mm -hmm. that's you know, very different from being able to track very large numbers of things that are moving around and have a solid handle on whether that is happening um, in the way that's intended. Well, then there's, there's also like internet of things, which, you know, if we'd had uh, the ability to invite maybe a fourth panelist, um, we could have been brought someone in from that that field, um, yeah. certainly like some of the things you're talking are not possible without having uh, sensing technology on a lot more things, right? right? It can't just be the cell phone in your pocket. It right. has to be that there's something in the package or um, doors now have something on them that like says, hey, like package received, package received, and then that goes back to the, right? And then that's a whole nother area that's evolving in the fact that you talked about um, 
just the speed of computers and how our cell phones can do so much more now. Now we can put so much more powerful technology on tiny, tiny little uh, microscopic microprocessors, right? Um, right. And and that's gonna that's transformative as well. That's right. Interesting. Too bad. I think the uh, the SBA and these banks uh, should hire Synaptic to uh, with the document processing, the <laughs> Paycheck Protection Program, and the amount of documents that's being submitted for these you know emergency programs is just mind boggling, and the amount of humans that it takes to compute all of these documents that are being submitted in such a sloppy way for these really specific requirements. I mean, I yep. just think there's such an immediate need right now, you know, as it relates to these stimulus applications that are just a complete mess right now. Yeah. I agree. We're we're fighting that right now. So as a company, we're in the process of trying to get some of that money and it is very confusing. And having um, the ability to digitize all that would be, I think, very helpful for speeding up the processing. And and the, what you talked about is so interesting, Tim, because the, the thing that sounds to me, and I'm going to like, translated into to what I would consider layman's terms. Mm -hmm. But you're basically saying is that the artificial intelligence capacity is is now mimicking better the way that humans make judgment calls about things in, in like a second, right? Just passport, passport, passport idea, right? right? Like we do right. that so quickly and we're now not, We it sounds to me like what you're saying is the technology has gone to the point where there needs to be less training on the part of the developers at the early stages for it to make that leap. Is that kind of what you're saying? Yeah, I think so. So um, when, when I think about what computers used to do well, so it used to be the case in AI that if humans had a hard time doing it, machines could do it well, right? So I would wager that like not too many of us on this webinar right now, if, we, if you handed me a differential equation to solve, you know, it would take a really long time. Mm -hmm. However, you can write, oh, I, yeah, know. I can do it. <laughs> right. the, don't ask Stefan that. Oh, is that right? Okay. Okay. Uh -huh. So um, <laughs> you can write a computer program to solve different differential equations really easily, right? However, you know, a, a, a three-year-old child can, you know, see a cat in any setting, you know, a cartoon or a real cat or, a, you know, a, a, a stuffed animal cat and go, cat. Um, and... You know, so, so those kinds of things, and again, so having conversations like this and understanding what other people are saying, every most humans just like, it, it doesn't take any mental effort seemingly to do that. Um, those have traditionally been the very hard problems for machines, but we're getting better at it. And, um, you know, so there are definitely neural networks out there that will recognize cats for you in all kinds of settings. Hmm. Um, there are neural networks out there that will tell you the difference between a stingray and a manta ray. And the only difference is the manta ray has like a little flare on the end of the tail. So they can learn very subtle distinctions. And it is getting to be the case that the tooling is such that, um, that you're right, that somebody can go read a blog posting online and stand up a neural network to do interesting stuff pretty quickly. Wow. I think the, the challenge, so what I see when I talk to people who are doing that, and you know, we have lots of conversations with uh, entrepreneurs is they can kind of get the thing stood up and go, yeah, you know, that kind of works. Like I can see that it's doing something, but then pushing it to where it works really well and solves your particular business problem tends to require much more effort and expertise. However, you know, I'm, I'm sure that as technology progresses that, you know, you'll be able to get higher on the curve with, with less effort. Hmm. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's incredible stuff. So, so let's move to Kelly. Um, Kelly, you've been working um, in the blockchain industry almost since its nascent. The space is consistently misunderstood in my experience. I know we worked together at one point on um, with a blockchain uh, company, and it, it's just the education portion of trying to get people to to know what you're talking about until before you can even talk about the the, the solution is is uh, enormous. Um, challenge, but it, it's I think it due in large part to the relationship that blockchain has with cryptocurrency. Since you've worked with over fifty clients in blockchain space, I want to know how you see the technology itself impacting the financial services industry and other critical infrastructure industries. Um, since most of these industries have to deal with you know protecting some form of personally identifiable information, so how is blockchain solving some of those problems? Sure. 
I think, you know, cryptocurrency gets sort of a bad reputation, but when you think about the first blockchain that's ever, you know, been introduced and where we got the idea for this technology was the Bitcoin network launching. And, you know, 10 plus years in, Bitcoin has still never been hacked. It's still going strong. I mean, there's been points of failure uh, in exchanges and things, but at the at the fundamental blockchain level, layer, you know, Bitcoin is, I mean, I'm personally very bullish on it as a long term store of value. But um, I, I think there's a lot of you know, a lot that we can learn from Bitcoin. Um, but you, you know, you bring up a good point, there's a lot of education that goes into it. And so one of the projects that I'm really excited about, especially during this pandemic that we launched um, with one of our clients was, uh, we work with a, a startup called fold, and they're basically trying to introduce uh, Bitcoin to consumers without changing their habits. So they recently partnered with Visa to create a debit card where you go about your day-to-day -day transactions with your debit card just as you would. So you go you know, shop at the grocery store or order things online and you're earning Bitcoin back as a reward. Mm -hmm. So in today, if you think about today where you know airline miles and credit card points aren't as attractive, certainly as we're you know, grounded and quarantined and not traveling, you know, Bitcoin is fundamentally potentially a better reward. And and this gives people the access to get a taste of what Bitcoin to, can do for them uh, without having to really, you know, dive in and, you know, sign up for an exchange. It makes it a lot more approachable. So I well, think as there's more, I think the technology, sorry, go ahead. The technology is meeting people where they are, right? Which is what Stefan is talking about in Tim too. It's, it's, it's finally making that leap where we don't have to like do something different to exactly the evolution. And how much easier is it to explain to your mom or your grandmother that, you know, they can just sign up for a debit card and go about their day-to-day -day purchases. And then the other uh, foundational aspect that I think makes uh, Bitcoin a, a better reward is that it's instantly available. So, at, you know, through the Lightning Network, which is a, a blockchain, um, you know, implementation of the Bitcoin network, which allows for faster and uh, more uh, cost effective delivery um, of, of Bitcoin, basically the consumer has access to those rewards. So you could apply, let's say you spend $100 at Amazon, you get $5 back in Bitcoin rewards. You could then decide, okay, the next time I purchase from Amazon or the next time I make a purchase, I can actually use those towards this next purchase, or you can stack the Bitcoin and save it for later. And and Bitcoin, I think, has a lot of uh, potential upside as a reward because it's very, um, you know, in terms of being able to translate it, you know, if you're in Mexico, it's very easy to transfer Bitcoin for pesos. It's very easy in America. It's very, you know, I think globally, it's a very, um, you know, fungible asset where you could, you know, transfer it. And then also, you know, it's got the upside of a potentially high performing asset. Of course, it's very volatile, but you know, if you do want to hang on to it for a long time, it has trended up over the course of time. So I think, yes, meeting the technology where people are is very exciting. And I think during this time when people's people don't want to change their behavior, but they might be open to, you know, a different type of reward. It's very interesting. And then, you know, Peeling back a few a few years, when I first got introduced to blockchain through a company that we were working with called Gem, one of the main applications that they were um, working on from a blockchain technology pilot program perspective was healthcare. And there's a couple of different use cases that just made perfect sense to me when I was first introduced to this technology. And one of them definitely relates to the financial services sector. We were working on a pilot with Capital One. And you're probably like, well, why does Capital One care about healthcare? Well, the revenue cycle management, um, you know, is a huge problem. And I can relate to it personally. I mean, how many times have you gotten a bill in the mail for a medical service that you've actually already paid for? Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, the paper trail hasn't caught up. I mean, the bank does not speak to the insurance company, does not speak to the doctor. The assist does not speak to you. So there's all these different systems pulling in all different directions. They don't know where it's at. It's a huge mess. There's so much money being wasted. And when Capital One saw the potential, you know, instant settlement where like, if this, then that, um, you know, if this person has this insurance and saw this doctor on the state, then boom, we can make this, you know, we can make this simple and streamlined. And as financial services are, are in, inherently just becoming more digitized, you know, solutions like that for much more instant settlement is just going to save companies billions of dollars. And so that made a lot of sense, uh, you know, as a potential use case of this technology. Yeah, it's, uh, I want that Visa Bitcoin 
card. <laughs> so I'll share a, I'll share a, a yeah. link. It's, it's, it's actually, it's in the wait list phase right now. They've got tens of thousands of, of applications wow. and it's uh, it should come in, in July. So it can't come soon enough. I feel like, but yeah. And I think, uh, so, so I want to throw a last question out to the panelists and then I want to make sure that we have time for questions. So, um, to our audience, please, um, if you do have questions for any of us, please pop it into um, the Bright Talk channel um, and we'll get to it in a moment. So last question for all of you. Emerging markets often adopt new technologies before, or at least in my experience, differently than established markets. Um, there's no pre-existing infrastructure in place for one, so you don't have to replace something. Do you see the pandemic as resetting things in the global market? And if so, in what ways? And uh, what will this mean for financial services and other critical industries such as healthcare, transportation, and food services post-pandemic? So Tim, how about you? Okay, yeah, I can answer that. Um, just very practically what I see happening. I mean, we get consulting requests from people all over the world and um, the companies that are thinking about dipping their toe into AI and machine learning are kind of pulling their toe back out of the water. So this technology for people who are not used to using it seems a little mysterious. Maybe they don't have enough in-house expertise to deal with it, which is why they're talking to Synaptic. Um, and I think the pandemic has made them think twice, right? Like this is something that we think is gonna be useful, but maybe we'll just do business as usual for a while. I think the countervailing factor to that is that there's gonna be a need moving forward if we keep uh, these, the, the life that we're living now continues for a lot longer, which it may off and on for who knows how long, where people need to be sort of a part. I can't go into the office to get, you know, those file folders that have all my documents in them. And so I think there's gonna be a push to, in some sectors, such as financial services, to start adapting some of these technologies or adopting some of these technologies, just because they're gonna be required to reduce the friction that's introduced by people not being able to conduct business the way they normally do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Kelly, how about you? Yeah, I, I think, um, you know, as it relates to healthcare, certainly, you know, and patient records, um, you know, be, being able to give access when need be, that's another application that we were working on with Jem, um, with Philips was, you know, access to patient records and, and giving cryptographic access, it, it, pulls back into what Stefan was talking about before. Potentially this could be done biometrically where, you know, if you're in the emergency room, you can give, you know, biometric permissions to uh, have limited access to your medical records where it could then be pulled, you know, so you're in the emergency room for a day, hopefully less. It's an access where they can see what they need to see when they need to see it, but then not for perpetuity. And so the, uh, I think, you know, um, Hopefully, we'll see sort of a forced hand. I mean, Stefan, you talked about needing to bring your technology to market ASAP. I think in technology, um, we're going to see, because of the pandemic, we're going to see sort of a rush to bring things to market. And there is going to be this sort of forced hand where we're going to see these efficiencies happening sooner because there's just such an immediate need. Uh, another project that we worked on where it just comes to mind, given the way things are moving today, Portia and I worked on a, a blockchain voting platform called NetVote um, a couple years back together. You know, as we're moving to a need for more digitized voting and even voting by mail, there's going to be need for you know verifying and, and tracking that data. So, um, you know, I think that that's where we're going to see a lot of implementation of, of these technologies, both machine learning and blockchain. You know, to verify this this data because as everyone sort of knows but doesn't want to really come to terms with there's just so much fraud in, in voting and um you know there's going to be a need for that so i think we're going to as we're seeing things shift in the in our behaviors there the technology is going to accommodate for you know better verification and security of the, that de data inherently yep that would be uh interesting to see what happens during election season in that case. for sure yeah stefan from your perspective in an emerging market like Mexico, the pandemic is definitely accelerating and if not precipitating the needs of having uh, new technologies, disruptive and innovative technologies out there to, to help uh, people secure uh, social distance, uh, distancing and, and having the same services as they would, they would uh, necessarily 
have in their an analog life. Uh, often also um, new technologies, disruptive technology in a market like Mexico is seen as, as, as a, basically a, a, an insurance policy to comply with with um, regulatory compliance requirements from from various uh, bodies of regulation, well, it has to be taken with a very uh, a very um, careful and and scrutinizing eyes. The adoption of those of those technologies, uh, like machine learning, artificial intelligence, blockchain, um, uh, advanced biometrics, in the, in this context. But uh, definitely, as I said, we're running around like crazy right now to bring our our platform to, to the market in order to help and provide uh, new services to, to, to our customers. Excellent. So um, we have um, some questions from the audience. Um, the first one that I'll ask, um, I'm going to throw out specifically to Stefan, but um, Kelly and Tim, feel free to jump in as well. Um, We've skirted around the issue of regulatory compliance. You just alluded to it in your last um, remarks. The a lot of the technologies that you're talking about, biometric authentication and all this, um, have to do with laws and compliance that are in place to protect information. I mean, obviously, we as consumers um, want our identities and and our information protected, but there are there are laws in place. So specifically, what like what technologies are solving for those compliance requirements around um, just, I guess, banking, but also like access to information. There's also adverse effect of, of trying to, to, to use or overuse, like for instance, facial recognition as, as a biometric technology, like California, for instance, <laughs> I, restricting facial recognition in public places as illegal. So, uh, so for some, um, regulatory reasons, it, it is considered that in California and also in some places in Europe with GDPR, that your face, a photo of your face or just seeing you, mm -hmm. you're basically sharing your personal identifiable information. Mm -hmm. So, so without a, a, a means of, 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 of protecting that information as it travels through, through a webcam, to a security camera, to your cell phone, it is justified to have, to have the, these concerns uh, in terms of, of uh, uh, personal information protection and also uh, regulatory compliance when it comes to personal data. It is, it is justified to have words and, and, and instead of trying to understand and find a, a good way to address the concerns, patch the hole and say, no, we can't do that. It's very easy to fall into that. No, we can't do that in California because it's, uh, it's a, 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 a little dangerous. So this is what we're trying to do. We're trying to find a, a, a measure between um, be, between complying with the, the the laws and regulation when it comes to personal information, and also attending to various necessities in the market. And we think that if you turn your face into a pair of cryptographic keys, you're in a very um, good position to protect your own your own information. And have a say as far as who's using uh, your 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 face through a facial recognition software, for, in, for instance. Hmm. So we have a two-part question. So the first question sounds like it's uh, open season. Second one's for Stefan. The first question is, um, should we see blockchain as merely an emerging technology that will optimize the back-end protocols of current financial service providers? Or should we see it as disrupting technology that is at odds with current financial institutions and will eventually change the very nature of how we think about finance? That's that's the first question. You want to take it, Kelly? Um, I, I think as far as I'm concerned, you know, blockchain is going to improve efficiencies on the back end of, you know, technologies that exist maybe today less efficiently. Um, you know, I don't know if it's going to, I think, you know, the pandemic and certain current needs are going to, you know, bear witness to new implementations, but I think, you know, it's go really what it is, is a way of tracking and verifying data and storing it in a decentralized fashion. So I don't know that that's, I mean, Stefana, I don't know if you have any follow-up thoughts on that, but I, I feel like it's going to improve the back end of these systems and the way that we implement them. But as, at a consumer level, you may not even know that blockchain is being used. I think that's fair. Absolutely, we can't begin to see 
I mean, it's very tempting to look at blockchain as, as um, um, peanut butter on a toast type of solution to, to resolve in any possible threats in terms of, uh, of data in a, in a database. Well, blockchain is not very good at, at at storing transactional data and something that it needs to be consulted very rapidly. It's and people think of blockchain as an emerging technology. It exists. It's been around for probably more than 12, 15 years now. So, so we we can't just think that maybe eventually we're going to have uh, ATM machines and a bank application that that provides a, a global type of uh, cryptocurrency into a transactional system that is temper proof, proof unmutable based on blockchain i don't think this is gonna going to happen this is not a in, in in my opinion a use for that technology i think a good use for the technology is having for, for instance consent uh, approval registry accessible to the, to the public in, in in a temper proof and unmutable fashion so i think that's where it's going to be going in the financial industry more than having this um, a version of Viper Ledger or Ethereum uh, as an under data protection layer in a, in a core banking system. I don't think that's going to happen. So there's a second question that kind of tacks on to that, um, and it's specifically for you, Stefan. Um, sorry, you're in the hot seat today. I don't know why. Uh, the combination of these technologies, biometric identification, peer-to-peer -peer banking, seems to be an open door of finance to informal economies. I like this guy, he's, he's speaking my language, of developing nations, finally moving dead capital into the market. Does this sound right to you? It is, sounds pretty right to me. I mean, I'm gonna say something a little bit controversial now. It, why does stealing exist in the world? It's because there is something to steal. No? there is something physical to steal so i'm saying this because i think governments in many countries just like my own country canada is going to start promoting a, a, an option to cash a, an option a competing option a fair competing op option to cash in in the market and this could be basically a cryptocurrency that you can trade around the world from from any type of devices and then rural area are the the, the, the potential areas where this could flourish very easily. So um, getting access to options for payments, for instance, or, or transaction that you don't have to carry a physical piece of paper in your wallet is, is something that has to be looked at in, on a global basis. Hmm. That's another question for Stefan. Um, <laughs> What's the role of ethics in your AI product innovation in terms of biases, fairness, safety, transparency, and accountability from XP users? I think that's a really good question. You were breaking up at the beginning. Can you watch the role of? What's the role of ethics in your AI product innovation? Yes, this is this is what we're trying to do uh, as a company is to bring a balance in the custody of data to uh, the members of an interaction. It could be two, three, four, or five people. Ethically speaking, uh, I, don't feel, I don't feel comfortable not knowing that there is a credit bureau in the US that have a complete history of my bank transaction, if I paid on the right time or not, without me knowing. At the end of the day, in terms of human rights, that data is yours. Mm. Ethically speaking, I think having a platform that allows you to be in the loop while these records are being registered in, in systems would be the best thing that could happen to, to, to any human being. Parents. You would be uh, integrated in this in this in this cycle, and this is where we we are trying to go to go at to change and turn the the actual balance of custody a little bit more like as a flat line so so a person would would be asked when it when um by through a system when when a third entity is trying to consult your your information and this is my right to know when anybody anybody consult my for instance for instance my credit file in the us so this is what we're trying to do and it's philosophical kind of shift um and and we have to get there
So I, I was just going to add that there's um, an interesting twist on that from the AI perspective. It's been discovered recently that a lot of these modern neural networks tend to have biases that are much like humans have. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of that has to do with biases in the way the data were collected. So it is not unusual, for example, for a network that's making a decision about you to pay attention to an attribute like your gender or your race or your age that we as humans would think um, should not be factored into that decision because it's, um, you know, it's not fair in some sense. And so in all these cases where you're handing more control over to machines to make decisions about things, that's something that you have to be vigilant about. Um, and, and there are technologies that are trying to combat that too. I want to know if you watch Westworld. I do mm -hmm. not, but I, I have thought I should. <laughs> should that's I? my question. Yeah. Um, Okay, I have I have one more question for Tim, and then um, I think we're we're at a wrap. Um, Tim, you uh, Synaptic work with a variety of different um, clients, and you mentioned earlier that um, the, the you know you, you're, you've been speaking to some lately um, and and to, to to different ends and with different results based on on where companies are with the current slowdown in the economy, but. Um, what, what are some of the companies that are latching on to this opportunity? Like there, I know, cause I'm, you know, we work together. I know that there are some companies in um, critical infrastructure sectors that are seeing opportunity the way that Stefan is in terms of like solving big problems now that have come to light. Could you just talk a little bit about some of those? Yeah, so, I mean, I would say one client that we're working with right now and that we've had a relationship for a while is in the, healthcare space specifically targeting um, trying to surface content uh, mm -hmm. that you and I could read, for example. So I go to the web and I search and I say, I've got some you know, symptoms or I'm trying to discover you know, how do I treat a particular condition that I might have. And um, what, they're, what they're trying to do is to surface medically sound content that is uh, gonna answer the questions that you have. Mm -hmm. And we're finding there are a variety of technologies that can be brought to bear there. So natural language processing is the general area. But the issue that we find in that case is that it's not simply keyword searching that's gonna work, but you need to have a little bit of a deeper understanding of the document. Mm. Um, and, and so I think healthcare in particular, and we have a fair number of clients in that space, are kind of embracing this technology to try and, in some cases, just squeeze more information out of the data that they already have, mm -hmm. um, or to you know have better experiences for their clients, people who are searching their knowledge bases or things mm -hmm. like that. So I, I, again, healthcare is one of the main ones that we tend to see embracing AI and machine learning to try and innovate. Well, I guess we'll see what happens, won't we? Mm -hmm. So, um, Thank you so much. We ran a few minutes over, but not too much over. Um, this is great. I really enjoyed the talk. Um, so glad that you three could join me today um, for this panel. Um, we have another um, webcast in a couple of weeks with one of the companies that Tim mentioned earlier. So if you're interested in learning um, how legal services is applying some of uh, the technology that we just talked about, you can join that webcast. Um, also, if you had any ideas that were sparked by today's talk, I encourage you to send them to us at Synaptic. We love getting project requests. Um, it could just be the beginning of a conversation. It doesn't have to be a fully baked idea. Um, there's a link in the webcast uh, attachments to a form if you have any ideas that you'd like to submit to us. Um, and there's also a case study that talks a little bit about some of the work that we did at Synaptic with DCO. Um, and of course, there's also a link to um, Crypto Kelly token podcast <laughs> if you are interested in diving more into blockchain. Um, but I thank you all for joining me. I will be sending you all an email. Um, hopefully you can give me some more feedback. We are um, very much looking forward to continuing our thought leadership series and um, hope maybe in six months or so we can get uh, Stefan back and Kelly back and we can talk about where we are um, in a post-pandemic world, God willing. <laughs> so. Enjoy the rest You're of your welcome. afternoon. Thank you all so much for joining me. All right. Thank you. All right. Thanks. thanks Bye. Bye.